Hey everyone, I love D&D, and 5th edition is my favorite edition so far, um, but I think we would agree that a few changes could make it even better. So I've done a series of those changes, I'm presenting them once a week every Friday, uh, and this week we're going to be talking about the Cleric. Uh, so I have made some revisions to the Cleric, there will be access to the document I'm referring to here in the comments section down below or in the video description uh, and in that document there will be a link back to this video. So with the cleric, uh, the first thing I'll mention is that I think the cleric of pretty much every class in the game is about as well balanced as there is. The cleric isn't a class I look at and think it needs a boost uh, and it's not a class I look at and think it needs a nerf. I think cleric works well at level one because we have decent armor we have some decent spells we can cast, uh, and I think it works well at level 20 uh, because we're not into the insane ninth level spells that a wizard has or a sorcerer has, uh, but we have spells that are going to be more powerful than anything any non-caster can do. Uh, and it tends to work that way for the cleric. The only thing I really note about the cleric is that sometimes we get abilities that just feel disappointing. Uh, and that's not to say that the cleric overall is weak, or even that particular subclasses of the cleric are overly weak, uh, because I actually think they're not badly balanced against each other either. Uh, there's a couple that are a little bit weaker, but mainly once in a while we get an ability and we just can't use it. You get a bonus to weapon damage and you don't use a weapon, for example. That feels disappointing. So what I wanted to do here is I just wanted to make it so that when we have an ability that we cannot use, we're going to make it so that you can use it. Uh, and the other thing I want to do here is uh, some of the abilities don't scale well. Some of them start too strong, but they don't scale well enough to be strong at later levels. I want to adjust those a bit, massage those a bit, so that they work better at all levels. So that's the plans for the Cleric. Those were the things I thought about moving into this. Let's get started. So as we look at the Cleric the Tree Monk variant, we're going to start out with our class chart and our class features, and I haven't changed a thing. Those are all the same. Equipment is the same. Spell casting is the same. In fact, everything is the same until we get to level 10. Uh, level 10 is the first moment where I found that there was an ability that doesn't seem to get a lot of use, and that's Divine Intervention. The issue with Divine Intervention is if it's something that we want to use in combat, uh, we don't ever want to use it in combat because it's going to use our action, which means we're giving up something important to be able to use this, and the chance of it working is low. That means that uh, we're risking a lot, and we're probably going to get nothing in return. So when you have that combat where you really need a divine intervention, which is the one that's turning against you, using divine intervention is probably not what you want to do. Uh, so I definitely wanted to change that. So the first thing I did is with Divine Intervention, I made it a bonus action. The second thing I did is uh, with Divine Intervention, normally your DM just picks what it does. And the Player's Handbook only gives the most basic guidelines as to what that could be. I thought that the player should at least have some control over what happens. Uh, because you're asking your deity to intervene, but you're probably hoping they'll do it in a certain way. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is kind of give it a collaboration between you and the DM. So now what I say is you may choose to have your DM choose the effect. Alternatively, you can choose the effect of any cleric spell or spell available to your domain of any level. So if a cleric spell is going to solve your problem, uh, you can use your divine intervention to get that cleric spell. If you need something bigger or better or more unusual, then you're going to have to put yourself at the feet of the DM and see what they can do for you. Uh, so I just wanted to give that little bit of flexibility there. Now this is also the capstone. At 20th level with Divine Intervention, you can get intervention from your deity automatically. Uh, and that's in the Player's Handbook. Uh, now, I've been boosting capstones, but this capstone I think I've already boosted. Uh, because if you look at what I've already added, the bonus action to use it, uh, the increased player involvement in what happens, 
basically what we've got here is a cleric now who can bring about a ninth level spell uh, with a bonus action automatically. And uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, it, and the limitation of once every seven days, I think we just can't play with that. Uh, so I think the capstone's already boosted, so I'm leaving it as it is. So the base cleric remains almost exactly the same. The only thing that changed was divine intervention. So let's go into the divine domains, because there are a lot of them. And there were a lot of changes I did make here. The first change I made was to the knowledge domain. And I made the change to their channel divinity option. And that's knowledge of the ages. So normally what would happen here is you'd use your channel divinity and then you get proficiency in a skill or tool for the next 10 minutes. Uh, and what I've done here is I figure knowledge cleric is an expert at these things. Uh, and it's just simpler rather than keeping track of 10 minutes that when you choose it, uh, you can have proficiency in that skill or tool until your next short or long rest. Uh, so that's going to be until you get your channel divinity back again. So if you want to use your channel divinity on skills or tool proficiencies, you can basically have a floating skill or tool proficiency using up your channel divinities. So if that's what you want to do, you can now with a knowledge cleric. I think that's a lot easier to keep track of than it was before, and it's not overpowered. Second thing I changed, and I changed this for every cleric, was the 8th level ability. Uh, so normally the 8th level ability would give you one of two things. They either give you potent spellcasting or divine strikes. Potent spellcasting boosted your cantrips. Divine strikes boosted your weapon attacks. So if you were a weapon using cleric, then divine strikes was really good. If you were a cantrip using cleric, then potent spellcasting was a good one. Uh, but unfortunately, then that kind of shoehorned you into certain subclasses based on what kind of cleric you wanted to play. Uh, and I just wanted the flexibility there. So what I've done now is I've done this divine attacks for every kind of cleric. And what it's going to do is, number one, you can add your wisdom modifier to any damage you deal with cleric cantrips. Every cleric can do that now. And you're going to get a bonus to damage when you use weapons. Every cleric's going to get that now. Uh, and in the case of knowledge clerics and most of the clerics, the damage bonus for the weapons is going to be radiant damage. Uh, but there are some subclasses I have given different options to. The next subclass is the life domain. Uh, life domain is a lot of people's favorites. Uh, and there's really just one ability in life domain I don't like as written. And that's the channel divinity, preserve life. This is how preserve life ends up working as written in the player's handbook. Uh, so you're in a combat. Everyone's taking damage. It comes to your turn and you're the life cleric. People are saying they need healing. You think, I want to heal everybody. Time to use my channel divinity, preserve life. Okay, so everybody, who here is wounded? Okay, now, how much is your maximum hit points? Okay, now what is your current hit points? Okay, so now what is your maximum hit points divided by 2 minus your current hit points? Okay, so now you get this much, you get this much, you get this much. That's ridiculous. That's way, way more math than D&D &D normally requires. Uh, just a stupid amount of math. And I don't think it's accomplishing all that much to put that restriction in. Uh, so what I've done now is, as an action, you present your holy symbol, you evoke healing energy, you can restore a number of hit points equal to five times your cleric level, choose any creatures within 30 feet of you, and divide those hit points among them. That's it. So, are you wounded? Yes. How wounded are you? 10 hit points. You get 10 hit points back. Boom. Done. Easy. Uh, so, just adding that little bit so that you can heal people up to full, I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. Our level 8 ability again, I've changed the same way I changed with the Knowledge Cleric. Uh, so now you can also add damage to your weapon strikes, uh, and it will be radiant damage. So that brings us to the Light Domain. Uh, now the Light Domain is a pretty good subclass, but the one thing I did find about it is I just find that the ability, the Channel Divinity ability, Radiance of Dawn, it comes in too strong at first level. And then it doesn't scale well. So then at high levels, it's not very good anymore. And this is your channel divinity. This is something you want to use. Uh, so what I figured is I would rebalance it. So I'm going to have it come in a little bit softer. But it's going to scale better so that it's going to be useful to you for longer. So now with Radiance of the Dawn, uh, we can use our channel divinity as an action. We present our holy symbol. Any magical darkness is dispelled. 
Each hostile creature within 30 feet of you makes a constitution saving throw, uh, and a creature takes radiant damage equal to 1d10 damage plus your wisdom modifier. So that is significantly less damage before. It was 2d10, uh, but the damage increases with level the number of d10s equaling one half your cleric level rounded up. So when we get to 20th level, it will be 10d10 plus your wisdom modifier. And then they take half as much damage if they make their saving throw. Uh, now, 10d10 isn't a huge amount for 20th level. We can cast other spells that can do that kind of damage. But it just gives us one more option, and it keeps this ability relevant through the entire career of our character, even though it's not as good starting out. The point where this ends up being about equal to what we saw with uh, Light Clerics beforehand is about 4th and 5th level. About that point, this is going to be the same as it was for a light cleric before. At levels two and three, it's weaker. Uh, and then at level six and higher, it's gonna be a little bit better. And then at super high levels, it's gonna be a lot better. Like with the other clerics, we're gonna have now divine attacks. Uh, so now we can also add our damage to weapon attacks. And obviously with a light cleric, we're gonna do radiant damage. So that brings us to the nature domain. Nature domain is one I thought needed more significant changes. Uh, and because some of the stuff with nature domain just doesn't make sense. And uh, some of this stuff just doesn't come up. Uh, so I wanted to give the nature domain a much different feel. Uh, and the first thing I did from the nature domain is I took something away. Uh, nature domain used to get heavy armor proficiency. I took it away. They don't get heavy armor proficiency anymore. I don't see why a nature domain cleric is getting heavy armor proficiency. I certainly see why a war cleric is getting heavy armor proficiency. Nature domain, don't get it. So it's gone. Second thing I'm going to change, Acolyte of Nature. Uh, this would normally give you one druid cantrip of your choice in addition to your cleric cantrips. Uh, now you're going to get one additional cantrip, but any cantrip you choose can be from either the cleric cantrip list or the druid cantrip list. Just gives you a few more options there. It's not really much of a boost, just a little bit more flexibility. Uh, the first thing that's going to get a boost is the use of our channel divinity. Uh, because channel divinity for nature clerics before was bad. It didn't come up very often. Charm condition isn't that great. Uh, so it was an ability that was really circumstantial. In those circumstances, you could use it. It wasn't that great. And it really just didn't give you a lot of options with your channel divinity. I figured a cleric should be able to use the channel divinity. In fact, that was one of the primary goals I had coming into Cleric, is because Channel Divinity is super against Undead. You come across against Undead, using it to turn Undead is your best use of that ability. But if you do not come across Undead, you count on your subclass to give you other options that are fun and useful. Uh, and some subclasses did that. Uh, if you played a Light Cleric, you were going to get to use your Channel Divinity. If you played a Nature Cleric, you probably weren't. And that just doesn't feel good. So I wanted to give the Nature Cleric something they could definitely use. Uh, so it's totally different now. So the new channel divinity for the Nature Cleric is Shake the Earth. Uh, you cause the ground to shake in a position near you. Choose a 10-foot radius area of ground within 30 feet of you. Creatures in that area must make a dexterity saving throw against your spell DC. Creatures that fail their saving throw take 1d8 bludgeoning damage plus an additional 1d8 damage equal to half your Cleric level. And you round that up. Uh, and are knock prone. Creatures that make their saving throw take half the damage and they're not knock prone. If the ground in that area is loose earth or stone, it becomes difficult terrain until cleared, with each five foot diameter portion requiring at least one minute to clear by hand. So we're basically getting a mini earthquake. I think that fits nature just perfectly, and it's something you're going to be able to use all the time. Uh, it is similar in some ways to the light cleric ability, uh, but there are enough differences here that it's not going to feel redundant. The next thing I change, of course, is Divine Attacks. But with Divine Attacks, uh, with Weapon Attacks, I'm not giving Radiant Damage to the Nature Cleric. They could choose Cold, Fire, or Lightning Damage to the target with their weapon. going to keep it the same. Now, in the case of the Nature Cleric, I had to change the 17th level ability as well, because before the 17th level ability directly related to their Channel Divinity ability. Uh, so now they're going to get Flesh of Wood. So at 17th level, your Flesh takes on Wood-like quality. You gain immunity to Poison and the Poison Condition, and any critical hits against you count as normal hits. So more changes to the Nature Cleric than other subclasses. Uh, then we're going to get into this Tempest domain. 
And Tempest Domain is the only one where I actually change the spells you get. Uh, because one sore spot for every Tempest Cleric out there is they don't get Lightning Bolt. So we're going to take off Sleet Storm and Lightning Bolt is going in there. So now your Tempest Cleric can cast Lightning Bolt. Otherwise, we're going to change our Divine Attack. Uh, and before, what it would allow you to do is Thunder Damage with your weapon. Uh, so we're going to get, uh, number one, the bonus to Cantrip Damage. And number two, we're going to get to pick. We can do Thunder Damage or Lightning Damage to our target. Because we're Tempest Domain, of course we should be able to do Lightning Damage with our weapons. And when you have Thunderbolt Strike at 6th level, you want to be able to do Lightning Damage with your weapon. Uh, so Divine Attacks is the way we can do that. And that brings us into the Trickery Domain. This is one that is a sore spot for a lot of people. Uh, now, I have said before that the reason why I think a Trickery Cleric is really underrated is because their Domain Spells are so good. Uh, and because their Domain Spells are so good and they are a Spellcaster, that's the biggest boost a subclass can give you. Uh, but I do have to admit that some of the abilities that a Trickery Cleric got, you just didn't use, or they were bad. Uh, and so I do want to make them so that they don't feel like that. Uh, I want it so that when you get a new ability, it can be exciting. Now, Blessing of the Trickster was one I always thought was underrated as well, because you can just use it all the time. And uh, so I kept that one the same. And Channel Divinity Invoke Duplicity, I also always thought was okay. I don't think it's super powerful, but I think it's okay. And I definitely think if you're not using your Channel Divinity on Turn Undead, Invoke Duplicity is something you can definitely use it on. Uh, so I kept Invoke Duplicity the same as well. The first thing I did change was Cloak of Shadows. Uh, so Cloak of Shadows, normally you'd use your action, you become invisible for a turn. Uh, and this meant that you couldn't even hide after turning invisible, because you're using your action to turn invisible, and uh, unless you are a rogue with cunning action or something, you can't use your bonus action to hide. So instead I decided to make it a bonus action. Then you could use your action to hide. So if you want to use Cloak of Shadows to actually hide from your enemies, you can do so. Final thing about Cloak of Shadows is uh, it always took your Channel Divinity to use. And Channel Divinity uh, seemed like a big resource cost for something that is going to affect you for one turn. And it's not even a massive impact for one turn. Uh, so I have removed the requirement to use your Channel Divinity for Cloak of Shadows. Instead, it's a once per rest feature. Divine Attacks. This is one that people despised and I totally understand because they got a bonus to weapon damage that was poison and poison is something that a lot of creatures are immune to uh, so it really sucked to get poison damage on your weapon so like with all the other clerics we're going to be able to add to our wisdom modifier to our cantrips which is probably what we're doing with a trickery cleric anyways but for those trickery clerics who are using weapons uh, then it's just going to add the weapon damage type to the damage of the weapon. Uh, so we're not going to have to face that problem with poison damage anymore. And then the 17th level ability definitely needed a boost. This is your capstone. It should be exciting. It was terrible before. Uh, so now we're going to make it really good. At 17th level, Invoke Duplicity no longer requires your concentration to maintain. Uh, so we're taking our second level ability and removing the concentration requirement. And that's huge. Uh, if you don't know how huge it is, that when you cast a spell and you have an Invoke Duplicity, you can have the spell originate from that Invoke Duplicity. If you're not concentrating on it, that means you can cast Concentration Spells from that Invoke Duplicity. That's massive. Uh, that can be Spirit Guardians, right? Just think about how useful that is. So uh, Invoke Duplicity gets a big boost at level 17. We get a nice capstone for our Trickery Cleric. And then we get into War Domain. I spent more time on War Domain than all the other domains put together. Getting the right feel for this, uh, it just took me forever. Uh, one of the most common suggestions I had is just make it a gish. Let them use their wisdom modifier for attacks and damage, give them extra attack, uh, and then it's basically a gish character. But that just felt so overdone. We've already seen that with so many things. The Hexblade, now the Artificer, then we're gonna have a wisdom choice for the Cleric as well. But on the other hand, then there was the problem that if you don't give them good reason to use a weapon, then why would they use a weapon? Do you want War Domain clerics to feel like they have to use cantrips instead of weapons? 
No, no, I want the war domain to be able to use weapons. I want them to feel like having a weapon in their hand is the right thing to do. And I don't want it to interfere with their spell casting. Uh, but I don't want them to be overly effective. I don't think a war domain cleric should be as good martially as a martial character uh, because they have all those spells in addition. So this one was tough, but it came up with the final version I'm pretty happy with. So the first thing that's going to change is War Priest. War Priest was one of those feel bad abilities because what would happen is you could use your bonus action to take a weapon attack and you could do so a limited number of times a day. But starting at third level, we're going to have access to spiritual weapon and that spiritual weapon is probably going to do as much or more damage than our weapon attack. So then we can either attack with our spiritual weapon or our weapon. And that kind of made this ability feel lackluster. Now, we're not always going to have a spiritual weapon up. But on those important combats, you want your ability that your class and subclass of War Priest gives you to be useful. Uh, so I definitely wanted this one switched around. So what I've done here is from first level, you can perform the somatic components of spells even if you have weapons or shield in one or both hands. Uh, so this is taken straight from Warcaster, but starting at first level, your war priest can use a shield, they can use a weapon, and they can still cast spells. Uh, because if you have a spell that has a somatic component, but no material component, then even if you're holding a focus, you can't complete those somatic components. Now you can. You don't need Warcaster anymore. With your war priest, you can now cast your spells. Secondly, additionally, when you cast a cleric spell of first level or higher, you may make a single weapon attack with a weapon you are holding as part of that same action or bonus action. So now we can do, whenever we cast a spell, we get a weapon attack and it's free. And it doesn't interfere with our spiritual weapon. It doesn't interfere with our spell casting. It interferes with nothing. It's completely extra. So does a war priest want to hold a weapon? Absolutely. They 100% will want to hold a weapon uh, because they're going to get extra weapon attacks for free. And it's not going to interfere with anything anymore. Then I've made it change the second level ability. Normally this would be if you miss with an attack, you can use your channel divinity, give yourself a plus 10, make sure you hit. Perfectly good ability. And then later on you could apply it to somebody else as well. I've just combined them. So now you can give the plus 10 to yourself, you can give the plus 10 to somebody else. As before, it will use your channel divinity up. Uh, and then sixth level, I have significantly changed. I now have an ability called War God's Wrath. At 6th level, whenever you hit a creature with a weapon, your zeal breaks the spirit of the target. Whenever they make an attack roll until the end of your next turn, they must roll d4 and subtract the result. So this is basically a unique ability that again makes it feel like it's worth it for you to be using a weapon. Uh, because if you hit with that weapon, you might not do a ton of damage, but you can have other impacts. Uh, with War Priest, we're doing extra weapon attacks, so that's extra damage, and there's no cost for it. But with War God's Wrath, the damage isn't what counts. We're also debilitating the enemy, uh, which I just figured was more elegant a solution than just adding damage to this character. So when we play a War Priest, we are going to get a different feel than if we were playing something like a Paladin. Divine attacks, just like with everything else, you can add your Wisdom modifier to cantrips now, uh, or you can do additional damage equal to the weapon's damage type. So all in all, I don't think I boosted the cleric much at all. Mainly what I did is I created options that weren't there before, and when you had abilities that you weren't normally able to use, now you had an option to use them. But I tended not to make them super powerful. Even a war cleric being able to attack with a weapon once when they cast a spell sounds pretty good, but if you think about it, it's only first higher level spells. So these are spells that are using spell slots. So this isn't happening all the time. And it's a single unboosted weapon attack from a character that probably has wisdom as the primary ability score. So they're not using the primary ability score for that attack. Uh, quite often they're going to have a weapon and shield, uh, in which case we might be talking about D8 plus two damage if you hit. Uh, so it's not going to be a huge boost, but it feels good. It feels good because now your war cleric has a reason to hold that weapon and they're not feeling penalized for it. Uh, it's just extra and it's something that they're going to be doing. Even if they use cantrips once in a while, 
they will definitely be using a weapon because they're just doing it for free. And later on, when they use that weapon, it's going to feel good that although everybody else is doing more damage than you, you're doing something to the enemies that nobody else is doing. So again, it's just a feel good thing. It's not huge. D4, big deal. But it just is something that you've got that is going to feel good to get. And that's why I wanted it in there. So that's the Cleric, the Treant Monk variant. As I said, the main class got very little changes. Uh, the main changes were to the subclasses, and most of those changes are pretty minor. It's mostly just a rebalancing of things. Uh, bigger changes to the Nature Cleric, bigger changes to the War Cleric, uh, bigger changes to the Trickery Cleric. Uh, but for most of the subclasses, we're talking about minor tweaks at most. So tell me what you think in the comment section down below. And next week, we're going to take a look at the Bard. Uh, and until next week, I'm going to sit back, relax, have some fun. D&D &D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Mm -hmm.